It is seven o'clock. Good to see you this morning. A government still in the firing line over those poor conditions at migrant processing centres. Plus yet another damning report into police culture. Two big stories to get into. On today's show, the Transport Secretary Mark Harper, plus the Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting. It is Wednesday, the 2nd of November. Vetting failures, how hundreds or perhaps thousands of bad apples could be working in the police force. We hear from one woman about her own harrowing experience. They said, um, you know, they'd ripped the piercing out of my um, ear and then they said, oh, let's see if she's got any more. A warning from the Prison Officers Union of potential riots here at the Manston Migrant Processing Centre as a new report reveals hundreds of children housed in hotels have gone missing. Sky News reports from the trenches on the road to Kherson. As the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson tells us, he doesn't believe that Russia will use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. It's like the First World War down here. It's very compact, claustrophobic, really. People sleep in, in holes in the walls. You fear that he could use a tactical nuclear weapon? I don't, I don't, think, he, I don't think he will. I, I think he'd be crazy to, to do so. Calls to quit. As pressure grows on Matt Hancock over his decision to head to the jungle, he reveals why he's chosen to go. Air raid sirens sound in South Korea after North Korea fires several missiles after a series of previous tests ordered by its leader Kim Jong-un. Also ahead on the programme, The Oil Machine, a new film delves into our destructive relationship with the fossil fuel. I'll be speaking to an activist who worked on the film at half past nine. And do you remember this? Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. You can now choose to relive the iconic 90s hit Train Spotting, but this time live on stage. I'll be speaking to the actor director behind it at quarter to ten. Morning all, there's a warning that hundreds, if not thousands, of corrupt police officers could be serving in forces in England and Wales from a watchdog that's condemned police vetting standards. His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services looked at eight forces in a review ordered after the murder of Sarah Everard by former officer Wayne Cousins. Sky's Becky Cottrell has the detail. Just a warning, her report does contain descriptions of incidents that some may find distressing. What you're about to hear is police officers discussing a woman who's just been strip searched. <laughs> Back in 2013, Koshka Duff says she tried to help a teenage boy during a stop and search by police. But when her intervention landed her in a cell, she says female officers assaulted her. They were, you know, grabbing at my breasts. They stuck their hands between my legs. They said, um, you know, they'd ripped the piercing out of my um, ear and then they said, oh, let's see if she's got any more and they stuck their hand between my legs. Last year, Koshka received compensation and an apology from the Metropolitan Police for the sexist and derogatory language of the officers. But a damning new report has found that misogyny and predatory behaviour are prevalent across forces. The review team also looked at hundreds of files on the vetting of officers. There were a significant number where we thought that somebody just shouldn't have been employed or if they were going to be employed, there should have been a pattern of uh, supervision of them greater than normal that, that just wasn't happening. I think we're safe to say that over the last couple of years, the police have employed hundreds of people uh, that we think they shouldn't have done. The potential scale of the problem raises serious concerns about public safety after Sarah Everard's murder. Her killer, Wayne Cousins, a serving member of the Metropolitan Police, had been part of a WhatsApp group with other officers who sent messages described as repulsive and misogynistic. It has to be not just a type, but a wave of change. It has to be people feeling that they can come forward, report things, and, and then when that, when that is proved and that person is proved to have done that, that wrongdoing, they need to be gone as quickly as possible. And that process is too slow. 
The Met says they welcome the report and will consider opportunities for learning and improvement, adding, being ruthless in ridding the Met of those who corrupt our integrity is central to Commissioner Mark Rowley's vision of reform. We are setting clear expectations of behaviour and are developing data and technology to identify those who are not fit to serve. We will succeed with a vast majority of our honest and dedicated officers and staff. Change is needed now. As the review's leader put it, officers shouldn't just represent society, they need to represent the best of it. It seems like we're a long way off that. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. And at half past eight, I'll be speaking to the woman that you just saw in Becky's report, who herself was subjected to a degrading strip search at, by police. Half past eight from that. Uh, but as you can see, I am joined now in the studio by the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper. Mr Harper, lovely to have you in here. Mm -hmm. um, but but shall, shall we start with this, this, this deeply damning uh, report from the police inspector, incredibly worrying, not least, of course, because of Sarah Everard and, uh, and repeated instances of misogyny within the police force. What needs to happen for the police to get their house in order? Well, well, look, first of all, I think it's worth remembering this report was commissioned by Priti Patel when mm -hmm. she was Home Secretary in the wake of the... Sarah Everard Absolutely. murder, um, and it does contain a very you know, worrying number of findings. Um, and I think it's a real wake-up call for chief constables across the country. So, I mean, what the government hopes is that those chief constables uh, and, you know, the National Police Chiefs Council will look at this report and every force will look at their practices, how they recruit officers, you know, how they run their disciplinary processes and make the necessary changes to improve standards so the public have the confidence in the police force. That, that, that is the key point, isn't it? When you have the inspectorate saying that there are hundreds, perhaps thousands, of bad mm -hmm. apples, and, and we're being very mild with the language, yeah. they're bad apples, it seems almost impossible to me that you can restore confidence in the police until that situation is entirely resolved. Well, look, I think the first thing is, yes, the report is has a number of concerning uh, findings. But on the other hand, the positive thing is it's much better that we understand the scale of the challenge, we understand what the problems are. That's the first thing you have to do to be able to fix them. And the Home Secretary has made it very clear that this is an important priority for her, it's an important priority for uh, government, but, but ultimately this is up to Chief Constables and they've now got the information in front of them and the government will expect them to act on the, the, the recommendations and the findings of the report and the government will do what it can to support them in delivering that so the public can have the confidence in the police force that they need. Indeed. Uh, it would be remiss to have the Transport Secretary and then not talk about your brief. Mm -hmm. We will do that just a little later in the interview, but I think we need to start with, with Manston. Currently, what is the situation in there? The, the latest on numbers, do we have an idea? It was, it was above 4,000, which is at the very least two to three times the capacity mm -hmm. for this facility. Well, well, look, as you know, the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, visited the site uh, with the local Member of Parliament, Sir Roger Gale, at the mm -hmm. weekend. Uh, and I know it's a priority now for, uh, for him and for the Home Secretary to enable us to get uh, migrants out of that site you know, faster than they're arriving to reduce the pressure. Um, that has started to happen, but of course I think it's, it's reasonable to say it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, I've been an immigration minister Indeed. in the past. Um, there are no simple solutions here. They're very difficult, but the, the government is putting the steps in place to procure more accommodation, um, you know, to start work or to continue working with our partners in France to reduce the numbers that are coming. Uh, and over time, we'll be able to reduce the numbers uh, in, in that camp to what they should be. And, in fact, it was only a relatively few weeks ago that it was working very well, um, and it's... it's well, well you, got... say that, you say that. The inspector report identified problems dating back as far uh, as far as July. It did say that the camp was, was, was functional at that point. It, it clearly isn't functional at the moment. I mean, the latest development is the Prison Officers Association mm -hmm. uh, coming out and, and suggesting that, that we could be close to riots within there because of the conditions. That, that, that rather speaks to a desperate need to improve the staffing numbers inside Manston right now. Well, look, I think Manston's not designed as a large-scale holding centre. That is designed, what it's being used well, for at the it, moment. It That's is, the problem, But it's isn't designed it? to have people there for a short period of time before they're then moved into other accommodation. So that's what the immigration minister is focused on. I think progress has started to be made on that, but it's clearly not going to be dealt with overnight. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a, it's the number one priority for, for the Home Office, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very significant priority for the government. And I've, I've talked to both the Home Secretary and the Immigration Minister about it, and I know they're very focused 
on making progress on a daily basis. As you mentioned, you yourself were, were, were an immigration minister back 2013, 2014. Or That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you understand the, the, the necessity to use temperate language when talking around this issue. Was it right that Suella Braverman described the situation as an invasion on our south coast? Well, look, I think it's important for the public, that the, because the public's very concerned mm -hmm. about this issue and, and actually has been for, for many years. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that the Home Secretary demonstrates to the public that she understands the scale of the problem so that the public have the confidence that she and the Immigration Minister are going to put the appropriate focus on dealing with it. Uh, and, you know, there are no easy solutions here, but we can deal with it. When I was Immigration Minister, we had a huge problem with people coming in, uh, trucks... I, I, I know, Eurostar. but we're talking, we're talking about the language with here. We are, with respect, we're talking about the yep. language here, Mr Harper. Would you have used the phrase, an invasion on the South Coast? Well, well look... In the immediate aftermath of a petrol bomb attack on a migrant well, look, facility? Every politician chooses to express themselves in, in the way that they do. Mm -hmm. And I think what was important, the Home Secretary was trying to convey to the House of Commons that she understood the scale of the challenge so that people at home who are concerned about this issue know that it's an important priority for her and for the Home Office to deal with this problem. And I think, actually, the public understanding that politicians get that this is a real problem... Indeed. ..actually can help people feel reassured that someone gets the problem and is focused on dealing with it. But, but, but which is actually you, a good thing, but, not a bad I, thing. I, I, I get that, but, again, Inflammatory language such as that has been seen as an incitement to violence by people within your own party. You yourself, back when you were an immigration minister, were responsible for those go-home vans. And you remember mm -hmm. yourself, I'm sure, very, very well, the criticism that you received at the time from people who had come here as refugees, from people who had come here as economic migrants because of the, mm -hmm. the tone that was struck. Uh, does, does the Conservative Party sometimes, or the right of the Conservative Party, sometimes have a problem with the language it, it deploys, clearly reaching out to certain parts of the community uh, like this? I mean, mm -hmm. you, were, you were pilloried for this. Well, some people criticise me, but, I mean, they're very clear. They're about whether people who are here illegally or not. I'm very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, our country welcomes people who come here legally. We uh, provide safe refuge for people fleeing from... A war and persecution. You know, we've had a fantastic response from both the government and the public mm -hmm. for people fleeing from the war in Ukraine. You know, we've got 140,000 people you know, here you know, who we've made no welcome. Here. There are no safe routes here unless you are from Hong Kong, Ukraine, uh, or, or indeed Afghanistan. The only way that people can get here is across the channel. In well, small but, but, but with respect, people who are in France mm -hmm. are in a safe country, mm -hmm. uh, and we've always been clear that people should seek asylum in the first safe country there is. People may have been who are clear, but they don't have to listen to you. Legally, who, they don't have to listen but to. people who are in France mm -hmm. are safe. Mm -hmm. They're not fleeing from France, um, so they're actually in a safe place. And we've been clear, and I was very encouraged mm -hmm. last week, the Prime Minister had a, an introductory call with President Macron, mm -hmm. and I think they agreed that both of our countries would continue to work together and would step up our cooperation, um, because we're only going to deal with this issue if we work closely with our partners in France. Let, let, do, do you think France is doing enough? Well, I think... I think both of both countries, Britain and France, could both do more. So what we need to do is work with the French. They do a lot already. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, provide resources to help them. And, of course, people will know that our border controls uh, in France are actually physically located in France, and we've always worked in mm -hmm. close partnership with French authorities. Do we think they could do more? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we could do more as well, and it's about improving that partnership, and that's why let's... that conversation with the Prime Minister and the President were, were so welcome. Let's, let, let's hope that bears fruit. Before we just get on to transport, um, uh, on, on taxation, Treasury sources yesterday appeared to confirm that we are about to see tax rises uh, across the board. Is that your understanding? Well, look, it, 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 the... Prime Minister and the Chancellor have both been clear mm -hmm. in the autumn statement that we've obviously got to set out a very credible fiscal uh, plan. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to make difficult decisions. It would be quite wrong for me to speculate on those. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go beyond what either the Prime Minister or the Chancellor have said already. But we are, look, we are going to have to make difficult decisions. And it's important, if we produce an autumn statement that is credible, mm -hmm. That will mean that we bear down on inflation more quickly. Mm -hmm. And why that matters to people listening to this programme is that means we'll be able to have inflation uh, interest rates lower than they would otherwise mm -hmm. be, which obviously directly feeds through into people's mortgages. So a credible plan is going to require tough decisions, but obviously the Chancellor will lay out both sides of the ledger, as it were, the tax measures and spending measures in one place on the 17th of November.
Let's go to your brief then, shall we? And, and a big decision that you have to make it regards High Speed 2 and the Northern Powerhouse Rail Link. Mm -hmm. uh, ca can you confirm whether or not you will be upholding what Liz Truss promised at the Conservative Party conference, that you will be building that high-speed line in full from Manchester to Leeds via Bradford? So, so two things. First of all, on High Speed 2, because there were various stories that popped up at the weekend, the government remains committed to delivering High Speed 2 mm -hmm. uh, on time and within budget. Very specifically, um, though, on that high speed line between Manchester and Leeds with that station in Bradford. Well, we're, we're, well look, I, I think it's fair to say, as things that the former Prime Minister said, mm -hmm. R Rishi Sunak made it clear when he became Prime Minister that... For, for all the best motives, a number of mistakes were made and mm -hmm. he was elected as Prime Minister in part to fix them. Mm -hmm. so, so we're going back to our 2019 manifesto looking at the commitments we made. We have got a commitment to make sure we can get high-speed trains to Leeds mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing in my department and what I've been briefed on is we're looking at all of the options that are available to do that. So, so and I, and I will be hasn't take, been taken? I, I, no, I will be looking at all of the options to do that mm -hmm. you know, in light of the decisions we take in the autumn statement and then we'll be setting out our plans in due course. But you can understand um, the level and of frustration. Uh, and I've only, of course, been in this oh, job for I, a week so I've got to, you know, we've got to look at this properly. They're big decisions. We're very committed to delivering you know, what's in the integrated rail mm -hmm. plan, and there are a number of options for how we deliver high-speed services to Leeds, and that's what I'm looking at those options and decisions will be taken in due course. Yeah, indeed, so, so it sounds at least that, that there is a decision pending on that, but another promise that, that, that uh, Liz Truss made regards yeah, the Sheffield Bradford, uh, Don, sorry, Doncaster Sheffield Airport, perfectly good airport that, as things stand, is now going to go entirely to waste. That coupled with that high-speed line could turn that part of the country into a powerhouse. So it, is, it, is it possible that you and your role as Transport Secretary will, will look again at Doncaster Sheffield? Well, well look, Doncaster Sheffield is, is obviously owned by a, a private company. And they turned down, um, pub, they they turned down public money. They've, they've, um, they, they've had some of offer of support from, from local authorities, uh, and I know they're looking at some bids that have been made for the airport. Um, you know, that's a decision for them. I, I know my predecessor, and indeed I've asked the uh, aviation minister to continue working both with the company to encourage them to look at those bids seriously mm -hmm. uh, and also you know I've spoken to local members of parliament and the aviation minister will continue to say and we encourage them to look at constructive solutions for that airport. Can, can we conclude our discussion this morning um, by referring to your former Conservative Party colleague uh, Matt Hancock? Sure. I just want to, to, to read you this quote um, from the deputy chairman of his uh, local Conservative Association. I'm looking forward to him eating a kangaroo's penis Quote me, you can quote me on that. Andy, we, we, we certainly have. Uh, will you be looking forward to watching Mr Hancock eating kangaroo penis? No, I... can't believe I, I'm saying this on I, television. I, it's I, the yeah. high point of my career. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say it on television. Look, uh, on this situation, I think, uh, as a former Chief Whip, yeah. I, I very much support the decision the Chief Whip has taken, which is members of Parliament's first responsibility when Parliament is sitting, yeah. is, is to serve their constituents. And, and the Chief more, than that, has... more than that, he was the Health Secretary during the Covid pandemic and the Covid inquiry is about to start. It is a complete derogation of his responsibilities, isn't it, to go away and mince around in the jungle well, for look, a couple the, of weeks. The, the Chief Whip's made the position clear, which mm. is he's made a decision that going on I'm a Celebrity is not compatible with doing your job properly as a Member of Parliament, which is why the whip's been taken away. Mm -hmm. And as a former Chief Whip, I completely support those decisions taken by my successor. Would you support him standing down as an MP? Well, look, he's now currently... By well, he now currently doesn't have the Conservative whip, mm -hmm. so he's sitting as an independent Member of Parliament. What he chooses to do in the future is a matter of him. The Chief Whip's made the position of the Conservative Party very clear, mm -hmm. which is Members of Parliament should focus on doing their job, serving their constituents in their constituencies and in the House of Commons. I would bet that if the tables were turned that this was a Labour politician, you would be calling for there to be a by-election over this. Well, look... Decisions about whether people stand at the future election are for them, but the Chief Whip's made it very clear it's not acceptable for Conservative members of Parliament to go on celebrity television programmes when Parliament's sitting. Our job is to represent our constituents in our constituencies and in the House of Commons. That position is very clear. I think my colleagues will have looked at that signal from the Chief Whip um, and the Prime Minister about what the appropriate behaviour is, and I'm sure the lessons will be learned by my colleagues. Will you be, like me, assigning the number uh, to uh, nominate him for Bruce Tucker trials to your speed dial? Uh, well, I think that's, that will remain between you, me and my phone, <laughs> I think. Mark <laughs> thanks very much Pleasure. for Pleasure. Thanks very much.
Uh, now, much more uh, on that interview a little bit later in the programme. Uh, but two Sudanese teenagers who say that they were held at the Manston Processing Centre in Kent have described sleeping on the floor in soaking wet clothing. They were speaking to Sky News as pressure grows on the Home Office and indeed the Home Secretary about overcrowding and unhealthy conditions. And the Prison Officers' Union is warning of potential riots unless things improve. Tensions are rising, the population's getting bigger and bigger, there's, there's nowhere to move these people onto. I think that eventually we'll see a, a serious, uh, serious breakdown in public order. What does that mean? Potentially a riot. So guys, Matthew Thompson is outside the centre for us this morning. Matthew, just take us in a, a little bit more detail through the concerns of the Prison Officers Association, because they are legion and they are pretty significant. They're extraordinarily significant. The fact that we're even talking about potential riots at a migration processing centre like the one here in Manston is extraordinarily serious. And the reason they are making claims like that is because there is serious overcrowding at the centre. The centre, as you alluded to when you were speaking to the minister a moment ago, was only set up to process something like 1,600 migrants at a time, and even then, to have them there for no more than 24 hours. What we know has been happening in, in recent weeks is that there have been up to 4,000 migrants there, some of them staying for weeks, and the conditions, as you might imagine, are completely unsupportable. There is serious overcrowding, there are concerns concerns about sanitary nature of it. There have been reports of disease spreading and all sorts of things. So something needs to be done. The Home Office assures us that substantial numbers are being moved on. We don't quite know how many at the moment have been left, have been exited, something like in the hundreds, but clearly many more hundreds, thousands even, remain in there uh, and something urgently needs to be done about it. Certainly does. Matthew, thanks very much indeed. Uh... One imagines the situation in Manston will be coming up at PMQs. It is, of course, Rishi Sunak's first full week as Prime Minister. Just a reminder uh, that the event is taking place at midday today. Sky News, as always, will have full live coverage here on the telly or on your app. Yeah, let's take you through the morning's papers and guess where a lot of them are focusing their attention. Uh, here's the Metro. It describes the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock as King of the Bungle after his decision to fly to Australia to appear on I'm a Celebrity whilst Parliament is in session and the Covid inquiry is underway. In an interview with The Sun, Mr Hancock insists that he knows what he's doing. He hasn't lost his marbles. Uh, here's The Guardian. It reports that the government has drawn up emergency plans for how to deal with winter blackouts that could last for a week. Uh, the I... It carries predictions that householders could soon be paying an additional £880 a year towards their mortgages. Reports of massive profits for oil firms like BP, ExxonMobil and Saudi Aramco is prompting pressure for them to do more to assist people with the cost of living. That's according to the FT. Still to come on the programme this morning, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said... Vladimir Putin would be crazy to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. I'll be asking the former head of the British Army's chemical weapons unit. Also later this hour, a former chief immigration officer, Kevin Saunders, will be giving us his take on what's happening at the Manston Migrant Processing Centre. And then just after eight, I'll be joined in the studio by Shadow Health Secretary, the Shadow Health Secretary of Labour's West Street. Now, South Korea's military have confirmed the launch of a ballistic missile by North Korea. Our Asia correspondent, Helen Ann Smith, can tell us just a little bit more. Uh, morning, Helen Ann. I mean, there's a pattern of behaviour here. We've been hearing quite a lot of reports like this of late. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The South Korean military confirmed that 10 missiles were launched by the North Koreans. And crucially, a couple were launched in the sort of south-southeast direction, which is reasonably unusual. And one in particular um, actually landed closer to the South Korean coast than any missile uh, has landed uh, in the history of tensions uh, between these two countries since they were divided in the late 
uh, 40s. Uh, that one missile in particular that landed close to the South Korean coast, it actually landed south um, of what's being called the North Limit Line. It's essentially sort of de facto maritime border, sort of disputed maritime border, really, uh, between the two countries. And it was close enough um, that air raid sirens uh, started uh, sounding on the island of Oolong, which is off the South Korean coast, uh, and people there had to take shelter for a short period um, of time. Now, the North Koreans, for their part, uh, they say, they're saying that, uh, that these launches are necessary and part of what they see as a provocation uh, from the South Koreans in alliance with the Americans. There is currently big um, joint combined military drills going on between those two countries that the North Koreans see as very provocative. But as you say, part of a bigger picture. More missile tests this year than at any time since Kim Jong-un has come to power. The real concern is whether they move on to undertake a full nuclear test. That will be a much greater ramping up of what are already escalating tensions. Certainly would be. Helen Ant, many thanks. Now, South Korea's Prime Minister Han duk Su has said that police must explain their response to emergency calls in the hours before a Halloween party crush killed more than 150 people in Seoul. Transcripts show that emergency services received at least 11 calls in the hours before the crush, with callers pleading for help. But police only responded four times, and it's not clear what safety measures they took on arrival. The National Police Commissioner acknowledged crowd control at the scene was inadequate and has promised a thorough investigation. A uh, couple of the day's other headlines now. And the government has reportedly tested emergency plans to cope with blackouts lasting up to seven days this winter. The Guardian says there's a reasonable worst-case scenario of week-long outages due, due to strained energy supplies. A government spokesman told Sky News they're preparing for all possibilities, no matter how unlikely they are. Iranian university students are pressing on with sit-down strikes and other demonstrations, despite an increasingly bloody crackdown. Iran has seen some of its biggest protests since the 1979 revolution, sparked by the death of young woman Masa Amini, who'd been arrested by Iran's morality police. 1,000 detained protesters are soon to go on trial. Poor sleep patterns could increase the risk of developing glaucoma. A large study published by the journal BMJ Open found that too little and indeed too much sleep can make a person more prone to the eye disease as well as snoring. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu could be returning to power after the fifth election in four years. Let's bring in our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, with the latest uh, from Ju Jerusalem. So you were su suggesting yesterday, Alistair, that exit polls are, are, are pretty accurate. Where are we in terms of counting? How soon before we, we actually know the result? Well, first, Neil, good morning. And on the exit polls, they put Benjamin Netanyahu on between 61 and 62 seats in the Knesset when the exit polls came out uh, late last night. Now, that would give him a very slim majority. There's 120 seats in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, so you need 61 or above to get that majority. Uh, the counting is still going on, and it is roughly in line with what those exit polls predicted. However, uh, it could be uh, there are indications that actually Netanyahu could do far better than that and not just win a victory, but win a decisive uh, victory. It would be a remarkable comeback for uh, a man who is Israel's longest-serving leader. It would be his sixth term uh, as prime minister. And all of this against a backdrop of corruption and fraud trials, which he has been uh, undergoing over the last year or so. So it does look like it has been a very good night for Benjamin Netanyahu. We won't know the final results until uh, tomorrow, perhaps even Friday morning. And then comes the task of building a coalition. And it'll be really interesting to see what the makeup of that coalition is. When you and I spoke yesterday morning, I spoke about the rise of a far-right politician known as Itamar ben Gavir. He and uh, the uh, pro-Zionist party that he is a part of um, have polled extremely well overnight. And it is looking like that he might have a very senior position in any future Israeli government, which would see a massive lurch uh, to the right uh, of Israeli politics. Alistair, many thanks. Now, Jair Bolsonaro has broken his silence almost two days after losing Brazil's presidential runoff election. Now, while not directly conceding defeat, he stopped short of contesting the vote. 
The leftist former president, Lula da Silva, will return to power after winning by a razor-thin margin. I want to start by thanking the 58 million Brazilians who voted for me on October the 30th. As president of the republic and a citizen, I will continue to fulfill all the commandments of our constitution. It is an honor to be the leader of millions of Brazilians who, like me, defend economic freedom, religious freedom, freedom of opinion, honesty, and the green and yellow colors of our flag. As someone who likes to dodge unnecessary expenditure, I'm very unhappy to report that here is something that I actually might have to start paying for. It is, of course, the blue tick on my Twitter page. That is because Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, has announced that the platform's verified accolade will be charged around $8 a month. The billionaire says users will get priority in replies, mentions and searches, as well as the ability to post long videos and audio clips. $8 a month? I don't think so. Let's have a quick look at the weather. Anticipation is rising, and so is the atmosphere. Are you ready? The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the unsettled theme will continue this week, but a change in wind direction means it will be cooler. Most places will have a dry, sunny and rather chilly start, but there will be some rain in the windy west, prolonged and heavy for Western Ireland. That rain will then spread into the east of Ireland, Northern Ireland and much of Scotland during the morning, with showers following. Most other places staying dry with some sunshine, but Wales and southern England will see the odd shower. It will be cooler, with strong winds bringing severe gales to many western coasts. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, when the model Heidi Klum hosted her annual Halloween party, her choice of costume was... Certainly down to air. Hey, Heidi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Just hanging around or laying around? You know, just laying around, just worming around, you know? Uh, that was a worm. Uh, Heidi wormed her way into a party in New York wearing this. She inched her way along the red carpet, saying that she felt like a million bucks. Elon Musk, Ice-T and Julia Fox were among the famous faces who couldn't resist wriggling their way to the fun. Rather her than me. Welcome back. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, says that a watchdog report criticising police vetting is a wake-up call for forces in England and Wales. Speaking to me earlier, I also asked Mr Harper about the dire conditions at the Manston Migrant Processing Centre, a problem that he said wouldn't be solved immediately. It's reasonable to say it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, I've been an immigration minister Indeed. in the past. Um, there are no simple solutions here. They're very difficult, but the, the government is putting the steps in place to procure more accommodation, um, you know, to start work or to continue working with our partners in France to reduce the numbers that are coming. Britain and France could both do more. So what we need to do is work with the French. They do a lot already. Mm -hmm. uh, we... Uh, provide resources to help them. And, of course, people will know that our border controls uh, in France are actually physically located in France, and we've always worked in mm. close partnership with French authorities. Do we think they could do more? Yes. Um, we could do more as well, and it's about improving that partnership. As you can see, our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen is here. Morning, TC. Um, again, we have a government minister making clear that they, they do understand that there are significant problems at Manston, but... They're not going to be solved overnight, his words. No, there's a big effort to get the specific situation at Manston under control. We heard from the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, on Twitter last night. He said, thanks to the hard work and professionalism of the Home Office, as well as Border Force staff and military personnel who they've drafted in for this, he said the numbers of people, the numbers of migrants have fallen substantially today, as in yesterday, and will again tomorrow, helped by the fact that there weren't any migrant crossings on the channel yesterday because of the weather conditions. I understand that at least hundreds of people were removed from Manston yesterday. The capacity, though, is supposed to be 1,600, so it's not clear how many... Uh, wh when they will be able to get to that, because, of course, it is very dependent on what the weather does and whether more people make the crossing in the meantime. Um, let's talk, shall we, uh, Matt Hancock. He's been giving an interview to The Sun. We have a rough idea now of the thought processes that have gone on inside his head. 
uh, leading him to leave his job in Westminster and fly to the celebrity jungle. Indeed, and uh, on all the front pages today, uh, the former health secretary going into the Australian outback to uh, eat creepy crawlies, and this is what he tells and the other Sun things. newspaper. I haven't lost my marbles or had one too many pina coladas. It's something I've given a lot of thought to. I was elected by the people, and it's important to engage with voters, especially younger voters, no matter where they are, and show the human side of politicians. Now, look, talking to some of Matt Hancock's colleagues and, indeed, uh, some of the voters in his West Suffolk constituency, they're not impressed. They say when you are a serving MP, it's not the same as if you're a former politician. You should be there in Parliament participating in votes, and that's why he's lost the whip. Perhaps he feels that he's never going to go back into government and there's um, not, you know, there's nothing to... Uh, to he's just going to throw it all throw it all away for now. But uh, certainly it's made a big splash and perhaps that's what Matt Hancock wanted. It would be the most British thing ever if we found this new sense of national unity by all of us phoning I'm a celebrity to ensure he gets absolutely pestered. Uh, Tamara, thank you very much for now. Um, but let's stick with politics. Uh, and Boris Johnson, remember him? Uh, he says he doesn't think Vladimir Putin would ever use nuclear weapons in Ukraine and that to do so would represent a resignation from the Club of Civilised Nations. Sky's Mark Austin has this exclusive report. After being forced out of Downing Street and pulling out of the race to become leader, this is a former Prime Minister anxious to cement his legacy and most notably his support for Ukraine. Putin disastrously miscalculated. We all read his crackers essay on Ukraine uh, summer of last year and we could see that he, he fundamentally misunderstood what Ukraine is and it's a total category error. Ukraine is an, a free independent European culture with its own identity, uh, its own ambitions, its own destiny. But with the invasion not going Putin's way, there are growing concerns about just how far a desperate dictator may go. Do you fear that he could use a tactical nuclear weapon? I don't, I don't, think, he, I don't think he will. I, I think he'd be crazy to, to do so. Would uh, it change the conflict he, if he did? I think it, what would happen is that he would immediately tender Russia's resignation from the Club of Civilised Nations. It would be a total disaster for his country. And Russia would be put into a kind of cryogenic economic freeze. Uh, he would also, crucially, I think, lose the patronage of the Chinese. And above all, in his own country, I think he would trigger an absolutely hysterical uh, reaction. Perhaps more comfortable on the international stage these days, he says he will be attending the climate conference COP27 in Egypt, even though Rishi Sunak currently is not going. I, I, was, I was invited, I was invited by, by, the, by the Egyptians. So I'm very you happy to go. So you're going. Yeah. And you presumably think the Prime Minister should go? He's got a massive amount to, to do. We've got to sort out uh, a, a, a huge agenda. Uh, that's what he's getting on with. But if this is a man still hoping for a return to Downing Street, he's not admitting it. And do you still harbour hopes of returning as Prime Minister? Is it unfinished business? Mark, you promised this was going to be about Ukraine. I, I, I harbour hopes of continuing to campaign for, uh, for Ukraine, and that is my priority. And there are various other things I'm doing, but uh, that is a cause that is very dear to my heart. Politics don't always respect ambition, and all the while a desperate war with desperate suffering goes on. Mark Austin, Sky News, Central London. Uh, well, here to give us his thoughts on the nuclear threat, Hamish de Bretton Gordon, uh, former head of the British Army uh, Chemical Weapons Unit. Hamish, good to see you again. Um, uh, what do you make of um, Boris Johnson's assessment that, that Putin would be crazy uh, to deploy nuclear weapons in this manner? Well, I absolutely agree with Boris on that point. It would be unbelievable for Putin to use uh, tactical nuclear weapons. However, Putin keeps doing the unbelievable. So I don't think we can assume away the fact that he won't use uh, these sort of weapons. After all, he appointed General Savaikin, General Armageddon, as he's known, who I saw very close up and in Syria over the last few years. Now, Savaikin oversaw Assad using chemical weapons, which kept Assad in power. And all the false flag threats from Russia about chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, um, although it would be crazy to use them, we need to take them seriously. And the talk recently about dirty bombs, um, 
really is the most important area for us to focus on because Putin has said he's going to switch the lights out and turn off the heating in Ukraine. And all the attacks over the last few days have really reinforced that. But at the beginning of this war, 60% of that electricity and heat came from nuclear. And only on Monday, the Russians claimed that Ukraine forces had blown up a landmine in Zaporizhia, the largest nuclear power station uh, in Europe, which is r ridiculous because the Russian forces run it. So uh, I agree with Boris, a tactical nuclear weapon would be crazy, but um, I am really concerned that the Russians, uh, again, as the Prime Minister said, are, are losing this war. Uh, sure. Putin cannot afford to lose it. And um, the biggest threat, I think, is further turning off of the power and turning off nuclear power stations, which Putin has said he's do. And to do that, he needs to blow them up or set them on fire. It, it, it just though, in, it, in terms of preparing, you know, not second guessing, you know, the most dangerous man on the planet at the moment, um, and, and taking him at face value as regards a kind of a, a dirty bomb. How does one prepare for that? I, I can understand that you might ramp up surveillance and, and intelligence gathering to, to try and get an early warning of something, but in terms of practical preparations on the ground, what do they need to do, the Ukrainians? Well, first of all, the international community needs to underwrite and tell Putin that use of these weapons uh, would elicit a massive conventional response. And our new prime minister has done that, and James Cleverly, the foreign secretary, did that on Monday. On preparation terms, um, there's an awful lot you can do. Uh, and I'm publishing an app, um, which is similar to the one I did for Ukrainian civilians to tell them how to survive chemical and biological attack. We're publishing an app on Friday, which tells people how to prepare and uh, what to do in the event of a nuclear accident or attack. So those are practical things that you can do because, um, you know, w without without wanting to terrify people, and a lot of people in this country are terrified and, you know, get in touch with me all the time, you know, I don't think we need to be terrified here. But with the nuclear threat higher than it was for most times in the Cold War, it would probably be sensible to do a few preparations here as well as Ukraine. But the key thing is for the international community, particularly NATO, particularly ourselves, and particularly Boris, because he has such a, a huge place in the hearts of the Ukraine people, to make sure that they know that we're absolutely full square behind them, and that Putin uh, and you know his, his dodgy generals like Sabakin know that we will not accept them using nuclear weapons. And we can prevent them using tactical nuclear weapons because we will get a 24 to 48 hours notice as they sure. take these things out of their storage. And I hope that uh, our prime minister and President Biden have told Putin if he moves these missiles and looks like he's going to fire them, we will take them out. So there's an awful lot we can do. Yep. I think it needs a lot of cool, calm heads, but we must not assume that he will not use them. Um, Hamish, for, for reasons of time uh, on a very busy morning, I, I'm afraid we have to leave it there, but always good to have your input, Hamish de Breton. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, Ukrainian forces are fighting to push the Russian army back towards Kremlin-controlled territory in Crimea. John Sparks travelled along the road to Kherson and sent this report. The fields are flat and featureless, but this territory is critically important for this is the gateway to Kherson city, a regional capital and a military prize. We're looking to our left over there because that is the direction Russian forces are in at the moment and it is open here, it, it feels exposed. This is the Ukrainian front line, some 30 kilometers from the city's outskirts. Uh, go, 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 go. And we were taken to see the troops who live and fight in trenches and tunnels that stretch for miles. Sleep. That's where you sleep? Yeah. Alexander says cover is something he needs. This position gets hit every day. We found Vadim and Anatoly manning this post, their eyes fixed on the horizon. 
And they told us they'll soon recapture more ground. Winter's coming. It's going to get more difficult, isn't it? It's like the First World War down here. It's very compact, claustrophobic, really. People sleep in, in holes in the walls and their personal effects are tucked away in little cubby holes. When people talk about living in close quarters, this is a good example of it. There is a machine gun post that protects Ukrainian positions, and the local commander offered to take us there. It occupies ground the Ukrainians have recently seized, but the Russians are not very far away. You know, this trench was dug by the Russians, so they know exactly where it is. <laughs> At the end of a shallow trench, we found a pair of gunners. Okay. He said they were facing troops from the Russian region of Chechnya. The light was fading and we were told to return, an order given with good reason. The area was shelled with clouds of dust rising in the fields. The smoke to the east, the smoke to the south, the after effects of artillery shells or mortars. And I think it's going to be a, a long night for these guys. John Sparks, Sky News, in the region of Kherson. Uh, let's return now to the dire conditions at the Manston Migrant Processing Centre in Kent. Uh, we're joined on the programme by the former Chief Immigration Officer for the Border Force in Cali, Kevin Saunders. Kevin, great to have you on the programme this morning. Um, what is your view of what has been happening at Manston? Was this all too predictable? Or is it a situation, as described by the government, where those increasing numbers coming across the channel took them by surprise, causing the overcrowding issues? Good morning. Yes, I, I think you're you're right there. I think it did take them by surprise. Nobody expected uh, to have a petrol bomber on Sunday um, hurling petrol bombs at the facility in Dover. Clearly, they the people there had to be moved rapidly. And Manston was the only place, so uh, that that was a surprise. But there was nothing more they could do, so that took the figures up to about 4,000 there. They've moved people out now, but that, that, was, uh, that wasn't good. Speaking, though, to, to the Chief Inspector of Prisons, who, who went to Manston back in July and, and has been monitoring events since then, it, it, it seems pretty clear that there have been identifiable issues with the site for much longer than just the past few weeks when we've seen numbers rising. I mean, just in terms of the facility itself, in your view, is it currently fit for purpose? Well, uh, the chief inspector's report wasn't brilliant, but Roger Gale, the local MP, said some of the things they're doing there are very good. He highlighted the food and the medical facilities as being first class. OK, so, so, so but, cl but clearly, a, a set of circumstances in which people are being detained for longer than 24 or 48 hours in a facility designed only to house them for that length of time, a facility that doesn't have any beds, that has restricted access to fresh air, that has people using toilets with the doors open for security reasons, <clears throat> that, that, that doesn't sound to me like a facility we should be praising from the rafters, to the rafters. No, I no, I quite, I quite agree with you. It's, it's, not, it's not good at all, and you're right, it was only meant to be a holding facility for 24 hours. Um, there seems to be a, a bit of a bottleneck with getting people out of Manston into hotels. Yeah, we, we keep hearing from, from the government in the most general of terms a desire to sort out the situation in the channel itself. Uh, and frankly, I'm sure the British public, on the whole, uh, do not want people risking their lives, particularly younger people, kids involved, risking their lives crossing the channel. But, but they've had 12 years to have a go at it. And so far, no one has come up with a bright idea capable of stopping the traffic. Is it simply the case that unless we set up safe routes to apply for asylum here in the UK, people will continue to take this as the only option available? 
people will continue to take this um, forever, even if you set up so-called safe routes, because not everybody is going to qualify for a safe route. Therefore, the people that don't qualify will try and come across the channel. So forget that one. It doesn't work. What we need to do is to get some sort of working agreement with the French for them to patrol the channel in boats along with our guys on the channel and actually return all the people that are trying to come across back to France. Kevin Saunders, we have to leave it there. Many thanks for your time. Thank you. Now, as of next Monday, bird owners across England will be required by law to keep their birds indoors. It's hoped the move will help slow the UK's largest outbreak of avian flu. Steve Childerhouse is a turkey farmer who's been forced to cull his flock of 10,000, and he joins us on the programme. Steve, uh, it's good to talk to you about the circumstances in which we're talking are, 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 I'm sure for you, pretty horrific. Just describe what you've had to do on the farm. So basically, going back to a couple of weeks ago, we um, obviously had some birds dying. Um, we got them looked at by our vet, who then told us to get on to DEFRA. We had DEFRA out here uh, who tested the birds. Um, we then got um, diagnosed with bird flu. And within a couple of days, um, they're all moving in here with the um, culling facilities. And yeah, over the next those next two days, everything was cold. I mean, I, the emotional and mental stress of it all is just incredible. Um, you know, you just can't describe it, to be honest with you. It was just awful. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. So, of course, that means your Christmas trade this year is entirely, is entirely done. Is there any prospect of you being in a position next Christmas to start earning off turkeys again? Yeah, so the, the problem we've got going forward is is basically um, we have got to now have all these buildings around here uh, empty for 12 months um, and we can't touch them, we can't clean them out. So we normally restock in June um, of, of next year, but obviously we now can't restock until October. So on the way things are standing cu currently, that we won't be able to uh, stock again for next year either. Um, so we're potentially going to miss this Christmas and next Christmas. Um, so it's going to be three Christmas before we actually sell any more birds from here, which is obviously financially is obviously devastating for us. And it's not, you know, it's obviously not only us, there's like the egg producers, there's the broiler chickens, oh, everyone's getting affected by this. Um, you know, it's it's a massive problem that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, either, you know, there, there needs to be a vaccine or a way that we can move forward with our businesses. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. The, 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 I don't think people realise how how big a problem this actually is at the moment, and it's obviously getting worse by the day. Um, Steve, just, just just briefly, I first noticed there was a problem with avian flu several months ago when I went on a trip back to Scotland, my part of Ayrshire, walking along the beach. Hundreds of dead guillemots were washed up. There was barely a mention of it in the press at the time, and there was certainly nothing coming from government. I'm just wondering whether or not we are being perhaps slow to identifying the scale. Uh, of this avian flu outbreak and, and how difficult it's going to be? Uh, absolutely. I mean, these birds, I mean, the, the flu has not, not left England this year. Like it normally does, it normally leaves and then it seems to come back in the, in the winter. But this year, it's been here the whole year round. And, you know, it's been ongoing in the background and on the back burner. But, I mean, the area that we're in, obviously Norfolk here, I mean, if you look on the map, it's just been absolutely decimated and it's you know it's just by the day there's there's new cases and it's like I say it's spreading across the country i mean we've we've since our birds steve, have gone i'm so sorry after, uh, steve i'm so birds... sorry but we are literally in the last 15 seconds of the program i, I really appreciate your time we'll keep your fingers crossed for the farm okay no problem thank you